Okay, so if everyone could settle down, please. Thank you. We're gonna call Anika back up here so that she and Diana can really dive into the lobby ask explained. So what are we actually asking our members of Congress and their staff to do? So I will let you introduce yourself first. How are you doing? Thank you, Larissa. I am doing very good. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And I just want to hear how you guys are feeling. Are you guys excited to learn about what we're going to be asking Congress to do this year? Yeah, let's keep it up. <laughs> do you guys want a pathway to citizenship for undocumented communities? Yeah. That's the energy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a seat and Thanks. let you uh, take us through the session, Diana. Thank you, Larissa. And so as many of you know, there's currently 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, right? These are the same people who live with much fear and uncertainty every day. Fear of being separated from their families, prolonged detention, or simply a forcible return back to their home countries in which many times they face persecution, violence, death. And so what has, our, what has you know, the United States government done? They have abandoned them, right? Nothing has been done. They're not protected. And so this is why we're here today, to uplift our voices and make that change happen. And so we want Congress to enact a pathway to citizenship that includes all undocumented immigrants, right, this session. And so now let's hear about Anika and what is gonna be you know, our next steps to enact a pathway to citizenship this year. And so Anika, can you tell me, when we're referring to our undocumented communities, you know, we often talk about them with different migration stories. And so can you explain what are the different, you know, undocumented communities we'll be talking to and referring about today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're joining in solidarity with all of our 11 million undocumented immigrants. And to contextualize who some of those groups are, acknowledging that people come from many different walks of life and sort of migration stories. Um, we're talking about our dreamers who are young people who came here as young people um, and the only home they know is the U.S. They have been here the whole time. Like there, It is important that we make sure that they have a way of getting permanent citizenship here. We're talking about our temporary protected status holders, which um, I know you all heard about um, to some degree in the previous session. These are folks who have been in the U.S. And because of some emergent situation in their country of origin, um, the U.S. decided that it was necessary for them to have the ability to stay here for a certain amount of time period. And for some populations, um, that's gone on for years. When we look at El Salvadorians, for example, um, it's been decades that they've been living in this limbo of temporary protected status holders. So the irony there is they don't actually feel protected at all. They live in very short term designations, um, wondering whether they'll have stability. We're talking about our essential workers, folks who served on the front line during the pandemic, over 5 million undocumented immigrants served this country and cared for us in many different industries during the COVID-19 pandemic and continue to do so. And we're also talking about our farm workers, folks who keep our agricultural industry moving, who get our food on our table and so forth. And um, the, real, the real harm here is that for many of these communities, there isn't a channel within our immigration laws for them to be able to apply for permanent resident status, let alone citizenship. And so you mentioned earlier that undocumented immigrants don't have a pathway to any type of legal permanent residency. How can we change that, Anika? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly why we are here this weekend. Um, and while I'm so excited to, to have you all talking to your members of Congress about how we create a pathway to citizenship, which is a roadmap for undocumented communities to be able to apply for permanent resident status and then eventually citizenship. Um, a pathway to citizenship is the way that we safeguard our undocumented, our undocumented neighbors from harmful provisions. It's how we ensure that families can be reunited, that communities can be strengthened, um, that we can have stability um, for our undocumented neighbors. And also to undo um, an immigration system that we've talked about already that is so unjust, so inequitable, and that is completely bloated and ineffective right now. We have to find a way to modernize it and make sure that there are provisions that allow for folks who already are home, who already are um, a part of our communities to be stably here and to be fully included. 
Right, and so undocumented immigrants and advocates have been calling for protections for many years. And so what makes their advocacy different right now? Yeah, I think it's the momentum that we have seen. And when we look at the composition of our policymakers and of our country. Um, so just to provide a little bit of context, um, our White House is very adamantly in support of a pathway to citizenship. Just earlier this month during the State of the Union, um, President Biden uplifted it, said, let's get it done once and for all. Um, and that's sort of the momentum that we're also thinking about. Our Congress currently supports a pathway to citizenship. Um, the majority of Congress across party lines um, are really behind a lot of provisions for our undocumented community members. We also have um, our public, over 70% of voters across party lines also support a pathway to citizenship. Um, so the momentum is there, the feel is there. Our, our leading businesses support it. When we think about our, our Fortune 500s or companies from like Google to Facebook um, to Marriott Hotels International, they have all spoken out on the record saying we have pathway to citizenship. So while it is an issue that we have been pressing for for what seems like a long time, the reality is we're actually in a moment um, where we, we have the most energy, we have the most support, we have the most backing that we've ever had before. And so what are we calling on Congress to do? What protections do we want included in you know, any legislation? that is presented that protects our undocumented communities and includes a pathway to citizenship. What protections do we wanna see? Yeah, this is really important, Diana. There are four principles that FCNL um, is very concerned about in terms of how we pass a pathway to citizenship. The first is that um, we want to make sure that all of our undocumented immigrants are included and are protected in this legislation. So um, as a reminder, we're talking about our dreamers who are folks who came here as children, um, but don't have uh, permanent stability in this country. That also includes our DACA recipients who are folks who are here and they have deferred um, protections in terms of deportations. They have work authorization, but it's it's inadequate. It's not fully inclusive of the rights they deserve. We have our temporary protected status recipients who very similar to DACA live in these short-term periods of having some sort of acknowledgement. Okay, this you're here right now, you have this protection, but it's not long-term. Our essential workers, our farm workers. And in addition to these populations, we're saying, we also wanna make sure that folks who have been here since the start of this year, since January 1st, 2022, that they are on the path to be able to get citizenship. And the reason we look at it from that threshold is there's been previous legislation that's been introduced in the past that have followed that same model and saying the year that the legislation is enacted, the start of that year is when should be the threshold in terms of residence and eligibility. And so we are following that model. Another piece is the, the notion of permanent status. Currently, our US system says you have to have permanent status before you apply for citizenship. We maintain that and we're saying that folks should be here for eight years. Again, following the model that's existed um, in previous legislation that has had support within Congress. And then the next piece I really wanna emphasize is that we are looking for safe and humane um, background checks and vetting for those who are applying for citizenship. Um, Hattie talked a little bit about this, how we have seen the convergence of our criminal laws impact our immigrant communities, particularly our immigrant communities of color. And if we're looking at equitable practices, that has to be considered in how we shape our immigration provisions. And so right now, you'll often find that we have universal and categorical exclusions for people because of an interaction with the criminal legal system. Um, and this isn't just, it's not a safe, equitable vetting process. It's just meant to be punitive and exclusionary. Um, and so we're calling that um, while we wanna have secure processes involved, but we also wanna ensure that discretion is used and that people are reviewed on a case by case basis. This makes sure that our communities who are over police, who experience racial discrimination in our criminal legal system, that they aren't unjustly affected. Um, it also, speaks to the ethos of who we are as an organization at FCNL. We believe in redemption, we believe in a rehabilitative um, legal system in terms of our criminal justice system, and so that also has to apply to our immigration laws. Um, we also don't believe in sort of this dual 
punitive system, if folks have already gone through the channels and process that our criminal legal system requires, why are we then penalizing them again in our immigration provisions? And then the last piece is about no harmful trade-offs. So often our undocumented communities are used as pawns or chess pieces in discussions about immigrant rights or immigration reform. And we see sometimes people say, well, absolutely, we'll support a pathway to citizenship, but we have to talk about our border and border security, or we're behind a pathway to citizenship, but only if undocumented immigrants have specific penalties. We've seen recent legislation that has very harmful provisions saying things like undocumented immigrants have to pay fines up to $10,000 or 2% of their wages have to go towards building um, border security and a wall. And so when we're thinking about what a pathway to citizenship has to look like, it has to be fair, it has to be humane, and it can't have harmful trade-offs that frankly only over-invest in already over-militarized and overly funded enforcement system. So just sort of as a recap, we're calling for protections for all of our undocumented immigrants. We're saying that they have to have permanent status for eight years. We're calling for safe and humane background checks that don't harm people just because of interactions within our criminal legal system. And we're calling for no harmful trade-offs. Thanks, Anika. I really do believe that these main four protections that we're wanting Congress to include in any legislation really does reflect you know, the fair and humane immigration system that is long overdue and that is really needed in the United States. And so I know that earlier you mentioned these protections are super important. And so can you tell us why we're not lobbying on a specific bill or legislation? Yeah, absolutely, Diana. That's, that is a great question. Um, I mentioned that we've seen a lot of buy-in and a lot of momentum for a pathway to citizenship. Um, but sometimes that legislative vehicle isn't there yet. That, that is the part of advocacy. So for speaking to what we know matters, the protections, the people, um, and sometimes you don't have the mechanics yet, but that doesn't mean that you don't raise your voices and it doesn't mean you don't hold your members of Congress accountable. And so that's where we find ourselves right now. Um, there have been several pieces of legislation that have been introduced in this session of Congress towards a pathway to citizenship. Um, for example, President Biden's flagship legislation, which calls for protections for all 11 unmillion documented immigrants, but it also serves as more as an immigration reform bill. So in addition to pathways to citizenship, it's also looking at our refugee and asylum system. It's also looking at our borders and many other issues. And so right now, our call to action is specifically about pathways. And so um, that legislation is larger than the scope that we're talking about. We also have other provisions that have been passed in the House, but they are particular to specific groups and particular populations. Um, and we really feel that the urgency right now is for all of our communities, not right. just subsets. And so we are uplifting the four principles that we outlined and that we'll talk about repeatedly, but we aren't calling for a specific bill. We're calling for the protections and the needs of our communities. If there are folks, whoever, who are curious and want to know more about some of the legislation that's been introduced recently, um, you can go to our lobby resource table where we have a bill analysis on some very prominent bills that have been introduced within the last year. So that's the lobby resource table. We have a bill analysis, it's a two pager for you. And not only does it address some of the issues within um, and provisions within those legislation, but it also shows you how they um, meet or don't meet FCNL's four principles about a pathway to citizenship. Thanks Anika. And so I just wanna kind of, you know, provide a graphic of what our bill analysis looks like. And as Anika mentioned, you know, you can find these resources under our FCNL toolkit, you know, that will help you really, um, you know, provide you with extra support during your lobby visits. And so Anika, I know that you mentioned what our ask is. And so I just want to clarify that ask because it's so important to be clear. And so what you're asking us for Congress to do is to publicly support and pass legislation that includes any uh, pathway to citizenship for undocumented communities, correct? And this is right. for this session. That's exactly right, okay. Diana. We're calling for our members of Congress to both publicly support, um, because that mainstream conversation, that pressure is always important, and to also pass legislation to provide a pathway to citizenship for our undocumented immigrants. And when we talk about that legislation, we're talking about all of our undocumented immigrants. We're talking about permanent status and ability to apply after eight years. We're saying no harmful review and background checks, and we're saying no harmful trade-offs in order for people to be able to gain citizenship. So 
when you're with your members of Congress, when you're marinating over the ass this weekend, it's publicly support and pass legislation to provide a pathway to citizenship for our undocumented immigrants this session. Thanks, Anika. And so during my time lobbying, I've come upon a lot of pushbacks and misinformation. And so, for example, in my time, uh, I've been, you know, in talks and where there's it's for some reason there's this big talk about people not coming here the right way. For example, the word amnesty, which is really misused, right? It's supposed to be more of a redemptive solution. However, it's used as a very negative way in which we're rewarding people for you know, an authorized entry. And so that is obviously number one, there's really no means to apply or a process. And so that itself you know, proves that that is incorrect. And then, um, you know, can you provide us with additional pushbacks or, you know, misinformation, stereotypes that we may come up on our lobby visits? Yeah, absolutely, Diane. And you raise a really good point. So often issues within our immigration system, our principles are misconstrued and they're turned into a negative light um, and promotion of specific rhetoric or propaganda. Um, and the notion of amnesty is a very big one where um, instead of it being redemptive, as you noted, um, they're saying, well, we're giving incentives for immigrants to come here, quote unquote, illegally, or we're encouraging, quote unquote, bad behavior. Um, and we find other harmful pushbacks repeatedly. Another common one is with our borders, um, where folks will say that they're not secure, um, the U.S. is ill-equipped to deal with immigration flows and so forth. Um, and with our border, we find that it's really a way to deflect. Um, security isn't the issue at the border. There's no quote unquote border crisis. Um, that's a false narrative. Um, it's also a false narrative that the U.S. is unprepared to welcome immigrants. That is the legacy of this country. Um, and we very much know how to do it and we can do it well if we choose to. And I think we heard some of that in the last session of um, when, when the U.S. acts immediately um, and proactively and sometimes when it's a little bit hesitant and drags its feet on things. Um, but we are more than capable. We have the capacity. We have the funding. Um, that's not the issue. The actual issue is that we have misguided approaches and strategies. So when we're thinking about our border and how that's often leveraged in terms of it's not secure, even though the reality is it's, it's most secure that it's been in modern history, um, really the conversation is how do we move from this sort of militarized enforcement? Um, and what could the US be doing differently? Pathways to citizenship is a part of that. How can we invest in our communities? How can we invest in a more humane immigration infrastructure? Um, and how can we move from sort of these carceral practices that harm folks? How can we have um, a more encouraging, welcoming border reception that's also safe and also equitable? Um, what we see at the border is that um, migration is actually met um, with enforcement, despite the fact that most of it stems from humanitarian crises. And let's just pause and think about that for a moment. If you are an individual, individual in need, in dire circumstances, how is law enforcement the proper reaction to that? How is that the way in which we should be um, welcomed into a new place? Um, and so that's what we actually see happening at the border. Another one is pushback about quote unquote illegal migration flows. And it's really important not to conflate issues um, when talking about ways in which we can reform our immigration system. There's a lot that can be done. Um, and pathways to citizenship is a particular piece of that. I um, mean, it doesn't mean that other issues aren't valid um, in terms of our migration flows and so forth, but it doesn't mean that they have to be convoluted with the subject at hand. And so similar to how we see what deflections with our border security, we see that when folks talk about migration flow, and the reality is it's again, putting resources in the right channels. Um, how can the US be thinking about addressing the root causes of migration? Much of which stems from US sort of intervention and militarist practices in a lot of developing nations. We have a responsibility to actually think about how our response to migration should be equitable and should be accountable. We also have um, to create a more streamlined um, process for folks to be able to migrate um, instead of what we do right now, which is actually intensifying crises. So I actually think the opposite is true in terms of pathways to citizenship only sort of heightening migration flow issues. It's actually a way of us making sure that our system is more effective and that it's more efficient and it's more streamlined. 
we're actually beginning to undo a lot of the harms that we've actually created ourselves um, through our immigration laws and practices. I agree, and I know that part of you know the conversation regarding migration flow. You know, we also have to take the moment and think about who are these people who are migrating, right? And so there's many stereotypes also in you know saying that undocumented immigrants are criminals, and so they're not you know criminals. These are people, hardworking people who have sacrificed so much for themselves, for their families, to create a better life, right? And so these are our neighbors. They are you know the places in which we share you know, worship, they are our teachers, our essential workers, our farm workers, like we, you know, mentioned earlier. And so we really got to think about, you know, when we're trying to target, you know, special undocumented immigrants, it's like, who are these people we're talking about? And so we really have to take a moment and think about, you know, those stereotypes that are just wrongfully, you know, targeting our undocumented immigrants and the process to create, you know, a pathway to citizenship. So. So thank you, Anika, for sharing you know, those pushbacks. And it's nice to know this because it's a very helpful you know, tool that will help you and prepare you through your lobby visits. And it really does depend on the offices that you meet. You know, there's unsupportive, supportive, and it's nice to know, you know what you can be expected to hear from and how to respond to those um, you know, pushbacks. And so now to go with my next question, I wanted to talk to you about you know, if how, I may, I can... oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I actually want to um, mention an, another point. Um, one sort of to reiterate what you were saying, I think someone asked this earlier, I apologize, I don't remember the name of the individual, like how we deal with situations where the ideologies um, mm -hmm. are so disparaging and so different. Right. Um, and especially how you do it and being true to yourself and not compromising and so forth. And I think what you just said about how you personalize the issues in which we talk about is so important, how we personalize the faces of our undocumented immigrants. Um, part of that is storytelling, yes, um, but part of that is also making it real. Someone also asks about statistics and data. You got to contextualize that sometimes. And so when we think about our undocumented community members, um, we don't capitalize on their stories, but we can share the experiences that we have or the reasons that it resonates with us in order to be able to have our members of Congress think about this in a real way. Um, Bridget said earlier and it's that um, there are real consequences to our policies and laws based on the experiences of people. And so it's always important to say, you know, these aren't just words you're writing on a page and then passing. These are things that impact people's lives. Um, and then the other pushback I think is really important for us to emphasize and raise is that there's this false narrative about immigrants taking from the American people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a strong failure to underappreciate how much immigrants actually contribute to this nation. Um, I am always cautious about language that seems like we are monetizing the role of immigrants, but I also think when we get that pushback about immigrants quote unquote living free, that there are very tangible examples to show that that's not the truth. Um, immigrants have a lot of spending power in this nation. Maybe it's the um, how much they put into our, our economic streams. Maybe it's mortgages, billions of millions upon millions of dollars every year. There's billions of taxes that immigrants pay in federal taxes every year. It's nearly 80 billion. Um, there's nearly 40 billion in state and local taxes. Um, so when we think about our immigrant communities, our undocumented communities, they are paying their taxes, they are doing things that contribute to this nation, so much so that they contribute to social nets um, and social systems that they will never be able to benefit from themselves unless they get citizenship or permanent resident status. Things like social security, things like Medicare, undocumented immigrants put so much into those systems and streams, yet they are never able to benefit from themselves as individuals. And so this notion of, the, of immigrants taking couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is just as when we look at the history of this nation, immigrants are always the bedrock. They are always the foundation and they keep us thriving and they keep us prosperous and they keep us stable. And it's really important for us to remember that, that truth and that reality. Thank you, Anika. And so I am just, you know, very excited and emotional at the same time because I really do think that our collective power is there and this weekend is really going to prove that right. And so I just want to emphasize, you know, our ask one more time because like I said, it's super important that we're clear about this. And so our ask for Congress is to publicly support and pass legislation that includes a pathway to citizenship for all undocumented immigrants this session, right? And so earlier we mentioned that, you know, 
midterms are coming, and so this is an important, you know, critical time to get that legislation finally passed. And so, Anika, can you provide any, you know, advice, feedback on how we can best approach either supportive or unsupportive offices? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and encourage everyone in your FCNL packets that you got this morning, you should have your lobby roadmaps. Um, so I'm going to ask you to take those out um, and to look at page two in section six. Um, and so in your lobby visit roadmaps, um, you'll actually find um, that in, on page two, section six, there's a por this portion that says ask and respond to follow up questions and listen. And so Anika, your Anika I'm going to interrupt you just so people can uh, get ready, rifle through things. No problem. I think people are looking for it. So uh, to be clear, it's not the program itself, but in the bag, you should have gotten other printed documents. So it's one of those printed documents, not in the, the schedule program. Um, and if you're not seeing it, if you don't have one, then follow along. But for those of you on Zoom, you can actually go to fcnl.org slash SLW resources in order to see the roadmap. So I'll ask everyone to just take a look as we're going through. And again, if you don't have it, you can look at fcnl.org slash SLW resources. You can look at that on your phone as well if you have it. And you can click on Lobby Visit Roadmap and, and follow along. So um, go ahead, Anika. No problem. So when you look at the Lobby Visit Roadmap, um, it's, again, it's on page two, section six that reads, ask and respond to follow up questions and listen. And these are really crucial questions that you can be asking your member of Congress or staffers during your lobby visits. Um, the first is, does the member of Congress support establishing a process for undocumented immigrants to apply for permanent status in the US? And if they say yes, then you can ask them, will you publicly emphasize the need for a path to citizenship? If they say no, then you can ask, in what ways do you oppose a pathway to citizenship? What elements of the legislation we outline and the leave behind will you support? And so to contextualize these questions a little bit more, um, first we wanna know, are folks with us? Do they support a pathway to citizenship? Are they supportive of establishing permanent status, which then folks can use to eventually apply for citizenship? And if they say yes, if you're in a supportive office that says absolutely, we are for that, we have been on the record for that repeatedly, um, then the call to them is to maintain that pressure for them to speak out more, for them to publicly emphasize that we need a pathway to citizenship and we need it now, we need it this session. Um, that can never be said too much, that can never be undervalued because the more we have that in our main narrative as a nation and as policymakers, the more pressure we will see on the action side within Congress. And then for our offices that are unsupportive, that may say, we're not with you, we not, we're not there yet. We can still break that down and contextualize it more. And it's really important when you're in those offices, I know it can be a little intimidating to think about meeting with a member of Congress or their staffers who aren't there. You might wonder, do I have a purpose? Will I be impactful? Um, and you can do a lot that helps FC now in its work to create a pathway to citizenship by finding out, okay, well, if you're not there holistically yet, are there specific provisions in which you support? We talked about the four that are, we're uplifting right now, protections for all undocumented immigrants, the structure in which you have permanent resident status for eight years, and then you can apply. Um, no harmful provisions, particularly related to interactions with our criminal legal system no harmful trade-offs. There, are there one, two, three, four of those that you can specifically support in terms of eventually having legislation um, that creates a pathway to citizenship? And then uh, Larissa mentioned this a little bit before, but I wanna emphasize that for folks who are meeting with unsupportive offices, we have many different conversations in which you can learn more about how you can reach across, quote unquote, we have a panel um, on Sunday at 3 p.m. where you will hear from folks who specialize in immigration policy and who often work 
with more moderate and conservative offices, including issues like pathway to citizenship. We also have Friends in Unlikely Places on Monday at 3 p.m., which we'll talk about how you can navigate those conversations, as well as our 2021, 20, um, rather our 2020, 2021 Advocacy Corps members, yes, Diane and many others um, in the audience are also having a session on Monday at 3 p.m. to talk about the year that they spent advocating for a pathway to citizenship, um, some of whom were also engaging with more moderate conservative offices. So um, we definitely have ways for you to feel prepared and ready for those conversations. Thank you, Anika. And I think we've came to the you know, ending of our back and forth Q&A. And so now I believe you know, I'll give my invisible microphone to Larissa <laughs> so she can you know, ask questions and you know, I can help in any way I can. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. So um, I actually, before we do that, I wanna make sure that we are comfortable with this ask. I mean, we're gonna have like a two hour training tomorrow, okay? Uh, you will go through what a lobby visit sounds like. You'll go through that roadmap and you'll practice asking those questions, those, those guidance questions that Anika um, uh, put together for us. But before um, we do that, I actually just want to do that one sentence ask as a group. So in your leave behind, um, which is the other kind of loose document that you have, so roadmap is one thing, leave behind is another thing. That is the actual policy paper. So it has that one sentence ask, do this, right? And it has a, a bit more information that um, the point of the document is to literally leave it behind uh, so that your offices have certain uh, pieces of information. And if you're in a virtual visit, that's something that you email either ahead of time or after. But, but let's practice that one sentence ask. So I'm actually, I'll do it piecemeal and then hopefully we can all say it together. So here we go. I didn't practice this, but here we go. Um, repeat after me, please, okay. Publicly support and pass. Legislation that provides a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. This session. This session. Okay. I think they have it pretty well. I, I think you have it. Okay, good. So um, it's really important to note that we are not asking, like Anika said, for a specific bill. There are bills out there. They exist. Um, but, you know, we do have that analysis available for those of you who are interested. So you can see, okay, if there's bills in existence, why aren't we lobbying on them? So none of them quite do what we want this piece of legislation to do. And I think that's, that's the easiest way to put it in one sentence. But... Diana and Anika, our wonderful migration policy team, did put this analysis together. So you can uh, dive even deeper. If you're interested, it is not mandatory uh, to have that information for these visits. You need that one sentence ask, you need your story, and I think you're good to go. So let's get into some questions. Uh, we'll do it the same way we did before. So Zoom audience, be thinking of some questions, and Sarah will facilitate that. Um, but we'll start with people in the ballroom. And I saw a hand immediately yeah. spring up over here. Could, do you mind standing up if you're able to um, and having someone bring the microphone? Thank you so much. And if you could say your name and um, where you are, like where did you travel from? Hi everyone, my name is Madison Marcy and I'm from um, Johnson City, Tennessee from ETSU. Um, and my question was, um, what kind of actions can be taken um, to break the stigma surrounding immigrants and how they're wrongfully viewed? Yes, well, I think that's a great question, so thank you for that. I really do think that, you know, how we mentioned earlier, providing, you know, our social media toolkits is that is very a powerful tool uh, to really cre reach across, you know, many party lines. And so I think it's super important that you really emphasize the direct, you know, impacts as well of people. And so this is when, you know, Larissa mentioned the, the powerful impact of storytelling, right? So there's different types of stories. There's the direct impacts, and then your, maybe your faith perspective about, you know, a situation. And so it's super important that you really connect well with, you know, the reasoning behind of why this is so important. 
you connect to you really well with you know the human aspect of this is the right thing to do we're all humans and you know you know just always speak from your heart and I uh, that's like the best advice I can always give is use your own connect really well with your own personal story and that will really leave the way and also use you know like they've mentioned before use research and try to see you know there's also certain resources in which you can see state by state the economic impact of certain populations as well and so for example the new American economy is a really great resource you guys can look up online that one shows the state by state uh, you know economic impacts of undocumented immigrants their spending power taxes paid there's just many ways in which you can really do uh, talk about you know these provisions and get them passed with legislation with some you know support and you know any type of proof that you can have in research so thank you for that thanks Diana all right another question I I'm trying to scan oh, through and, and go to different parts of the room so I'm sorry if I'm not calling on you but um, Istra, I see someone right behind you. Yes, perfect. Can you step into the light here? Yes. If you're able. There you go. Hello. So my name is Angelo Gomez. I'm from Miami, Florida International University. Uh, so my question is, um, as, as a lobbyist and someone who, well, this issue is so impactful to, how do we balance kind of like the line of like, we don't want harmful trade-offs, but also like valuing kind of like the importance of negotiation and bipartisanship to get like maybe more offices that are kind of hesitant um, and then maybe including something that we don't fully agree with brings in a larger coalition which gets us to the promised land, which is well, probably Thanks for that question. I think it's really important. Like Anika mentioned earlier, you know, our lobby roadmap emphasizing once again the importance of it. It kind of supports you with some leading questions, right, depending on you know their answers and so I, I really do think that's a really great way to you know reach across but there's also the you know fact that 70 percent of voters across party lines already support this so it's it's really good to share this with our members of Congress because they some you know may not be comfortable enough to be the first you know individuals to come out and say they support citizenship if it's something they usually don't support and so that's a great way to get them to kind of you know feel more confident to publicly support you know pathway to citizenship and then that kind of influences other members of Congress to do the same then there's also the fact that you know you can um, like I said uh, ask to issue public statements I think that's that's a really huge uh, you know help that we've seen happen to get legislation passed and then just being direct with you know what type of negotiations are you know willing to do but that really align with you know our principles of seeking fair and humane solutions that don't include any trade-offs. Like, we don't want to see any more enforcement, right? We can't ask for legislation that really protects our, you know, undocumented populations while trying to negotiate something that's going to even harm other populations, right? And so this is the part where we have to, you know, really talk about our principles. And like I said, the bill analysis that is, you know, a resource that really does help you identify the certain type of legislations and negotiations that we're willing to talk about. And you got to remember also that our members of Congress are always willing to talk to their constituents. So either they're supportive or, or unsupportive, you know, they're always very important, um, you know, conversations that they're willing to have because you're their constituents. They're there because of you. And so they really want to hear your concerns and your needs and what's important for their communities, right? And so once again, uh, the economic impact helps, you know, sometimes these offices as well because they're seeing how much, you know, is really being invested into those communities. And, you know, election year, right? I think that's a big one as well. I think right now we're in midterms year and so many of their campaign promises have, have been included to uh, deliver some type of pathway to citizenship. Have we seen that? No. And so that's a good way to, you know, really emphasize the fact that nothing has been done and it's, you know their their time is about to end and so we want to see some type of delivery and so there's just different ways to you know really work with these offices but at the end of the day you just got to be really true to your own self and really explain you know why these um, protections that you're seeking need to be you know humane and fair and don't include any you know that don't include any type of harmful trade-offs that are just going to further you know target our undocumented communities who are you know the most vulnerable as well 
And so I, I hope that helped you. And like, we're going to have office hours as well, so that's a good time to also mention. You know, we could provide you with you know, extra support through that. And then our additional workshops and panels throughout the weekend in which we have specific you know, speakers who will be talking about their own experiences and um, you know, any type of advice they can offer. So thank you. Thanks, Diana. I think we'll throw the next one to Anika. Is there another question in the ballroom? OK. Yes, I see someone over there. Hello, this is really getting up. Um, I'm Lucy Engi, I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Wilmington College in Wilmington, Ohio. Um, I apologize for asking an economic question in advance, but most of my members of Congress are very conservative. And so while I would love to approach this from a person perspective, money talks in this day and age. So I was reading a little bit more about, I noticed the ask sheet said something about $2, uh, $2 trillion dollars and I was reading a little bit more on the website, and there was job increases. And Anika, you spoke about mortgages and taxes and all of that that comes with legalization. Can you highlight how we're getting to that amount of money and also the job creation? There was another point, which now my iPad is failing me. But anyway, could there be a little more context given to that? Thanks. Yeah, so I'll give the disclaimer that I am not an economist, so I don't know all the details in terms of how really reputable places from people like Center from American Congress to UC Davis um, out in California and their work has been done to, to figure out these numbers in terms of how pathways to citizenship will impact our economy. Um, but there, there's a lot to be said in terms of the fact that our undocumented communities um, already have ways in which how their um, working in the U.S., how those numbers can be contributed. And when you look at the opportunities that will be available to them once they are able to transition into citizenship, there are ways for folks to be able to, to do those trajectories and, and outcomes. And I think the other piece is when we look at where we are right now as a nation, um, particularly as we look at recovery from the pandemic, um, we are experiencing things like inflation, as I'm sure we are all very aware of. We're also experiencing a worker shortage. And there are a lot of folks, um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, for example, came out recently saying that immigrants are important for us to be able to get back on track. Um, and so the people who are in this work and who are looking at it from that sort of monetary lens, um, and not all of those people being from a more um, liberal perspective, like there's that agreement that in order for us to recover as a nation, in order to get back on our feet um, financially, that conversation can't happen without immigrants. Anika, um, just for you know, Lucy and anyone else, can you repeat the organizations at the top of your answer? Um, just you know, in, in case anyone wants to write it down and, and do their, their own research again? Not required, but I think it'd be good to just hear that list again very quickly. Yeah, so I, I share that the Center for American Progress and UC Davis, they did a joint study on the financial impacts that would happen if our 11 million undocumented immigrants were to get citizenship. Um, and it's quite thorough. They actually break it down as well as, okay, well, if it's not of our, all of our 11 million, what if it's just our dreamers? What if it's our dreamers and our TPS holders? So you can see a lot of very different variations in terms of what that would mean for our overall economy, what that means in terms of the wages of every American in this country and so forth. Um, the other place that I mentioned was that the US Chamber of Commerce also recently did um, some work talking about um, the benefits of immigrants being able to work within our country right now while we experience worker surges. Um, and Diana also mentioned the new American economy earlier, which does a lot of research um, by state and by district about the spending power of immigrants. So definitely hear you on some conservative offices, but I also want to re-left and reiterate um, that we shouldn't underappreciate the value of our storytelling. Um, and I say that when I look at the work that FCNL has done, um, especially looking at our advocacy core members again, right from the last year, many of whom were meeting with very conservative offices. Um, and in those first interactions, there was definitely resistance. There were definitely speaking points that they saw coming from their members of Congress. By the end of the year, was the member of Congress necessarily 100% 
supportive of a pathway to citizenship? Not necessarily, but we definitely saw that rhetoric change. We definitely saw them willing to entertain in some conversations more about some things. And that happened through the storytelling, that happened through the personalizing. Um, many of our offices know the financial numbers, right? So that's not necessarily what's gonna get them fully over, um, over the line in terms of wanting to support legislation. It's when they can remember why it matters to their communities, why it matters to our nation, um, and how we have a moral responsibility, um, as well as the economic responsibility to make pathway to citizenship possible. Thanks, Anika. And um, I'm glad you mentioned the Advocacy Corps. I realize I, I should give some context. We've mentioned this group a couple times. So uh, this is our community organizing program that we have um, a different cohort every uh, year work on a different issue. And the 2020 through 21 Advocacy Corps cohort worked on a pathway to citizenship. Um, and, and a couple of them are here. Can you raise your hands, actually? You're one of them, Diana. OK, yay. OK, I see a couple. So uh, these are people that have really um, been working for a while on this and are hosting a workshop that you can go and, and ask them pretty, pretty specific questions about what they've heard in offices and what pushbacks they've experienced. Um, and I think we, we can learn a lot from them in that workshop and, and hopefully throughout the weekend. In addition to those of you who are not in that program, but are doing this work uh, in other capacities, of course. All right, so let's go to Zoom. Sarah, do we have any questions from the Zoom audience? Yes, Larissa, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you great. All right, we have two questions. Um, both of them are from the chat, so I'm gonna read them myself. Um, the first question is from Hadi Jawad, and um, the question is about how our advocacy for immigration reform and a pathway to citizenship connects to uh, current and future shortages of workers in the United States. Is this something that we can bring into our, our lobby business? Is this something that we should lift up? Yeah, okay. you, you can take I'm it like, if you want. Maybe Anika wants to take over. Alrighty. Uh, I can hear it, so you can go right ahead. <laughs> okay, so I, if, if you guys go to the FCNL website, I currently, um, you know, just made a post on why a pathway to citizenship is important, right, during this time. So it's a blog post that, you know, can be very helpful and a resource that includes more economic, you know, information that you can use during your lobby visits. And so definitely worker shortage is a huge thing that is actually proven uh, to really impact you know, the country with the pathway to citizenship. And so that's definitely another conversation you can have with you know, your members of Congress. And you can actually refer to that blog post, which can give you additional information. Go to the New American Economy um, resource, which we just mentioned about, and that has actual state-by-state -state, uh, statistics data where you, know, you can use that as your um, you know, part of your tools during your advocacy time, during your lobby visits. And so that's definitely, a, you know, a great conversation and a point that you can bring up during your lobby visits. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just share the sec from Barb Adams with Eastern Mennonite University. Um, so the question is, is there preferred or appropriate language to be sure to use or not to use when speaking as an ally or an advocate for people who are undocumented? That's a really good question. Yes, that's actually a really good question. And, you know, this is a very sensitive topic also to address, right? And so there's, you know, this is a time where we could also educate. And I don't like to use the word educate because they should know better. But, you know, sometimes our members of Congress really do refer to our undocumented communities as, you know, aliens or, you know, very um, anti-immigrant rhetoric. And so we want to really change that language, right? And so the best way to approach that is to introduce that language when you're talking about, you know, these specific legislations. I, I'm sorry, legislations and populations. So you really want to, you know, you know, really do try to avoid any type of language that includes, like I said, aliens or, you know, um, immigrants, you know, words that are not meant to be used during our advocacy and that really don't reflect what we're trying to ask for. And so it's good to always approach it first. And, you know, when you're seeing a member of Congress that maybe, you know, speak about this and that way you can, you know, if you feel comfortable to maybe tell them, you know, this is, you know, how it should be, you know, how they should be referred as 
that's also good if you feel comfortable enough, but if you don't, I think it's good to approach it by just simply starting a conversation that includes that language and that way they can kind of mock it and then say, oh, maybe, you know, they, they want to, you know, they want to talk, they want to have this conversation that, you know, um, refers to undocumented immigrants as undocumented immigrants or, you know, our uh, populations. And so that's actually a really good question. And I'm glad you brought it up because it's, it's going to be big uh, during your lobby visits. And so it's, you know, better to be prepared with, with those types of circumstances too. And it's also good to keep your, you know, some peace with you, right? You don't want to go too uh, uh, defensive about it either. You really want to explain to them why you prefer, you know, referring to undocumented immigrants as undocumented immigrants or, you know, your neighbors, because this is truly how you feel that they should be, you know, spoken about. And so it's also good to have that balance too and always, you know, be respectful and mindful of when you're speaking to these offices as well. Because we don't want to reflect, you know, uh, the same type of, uh, I guess, response that they're having. So you really want to be the opposite of that and really uh, explain your, your side of the story or what you feel is needed to continue that conversation. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, so I think we actually could take another question from the ballroom. Oh, this person wasted no time. <laughs> um, yeah, Rosalie, if you could come up here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Jerome. I'm from Ohio with Bowling Green State University. Hi. Um, I just wanted to clarify a little bit, so we are not asking to support any legislation or we're not um, proposing a legislation, we're just asking for like public acknowledgement and support. So what would that look like going forward once we do our lobbying this weekend and then our representatives are like, yeah, let's go, let's get a pathway to citizenship. What, um, what would make that happen? Okay. And so, yes, our, our ask specifically is, uh, you know, like we mentioned before, to publicly support and pass legislation that includes a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants succession. So we're not necessarily talking about a specific bill. However, we have, you know, we have had, you know, lots of work with past bills that have been introduced. However, you know, our bill analysis that we just refer to, those state specifically why they don't align with, you know, the fair and humane solutions that we want to see. And so we want legislation that includes you know, no harmful trade-offs, that includes all undocumented immigrants. And so unfortunately, some of, you know, the past legislation that has been introduced does not really meet those, you know, those principles that we want to see included in legislation. So we're asking our representatives to kind of incorporate all of values into their work. Correct. Exactly. And so both representatives and senators at this point, we, yes. So it's good to emphasize that, you know, we want to see the public support and we also want a passage of legislation. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll let Anika jump in here in a moment, but just to further clarify, when we say there's no specific legislation, we mean existing legislation. Mm -hmm. So there are bills that exist, and we are not asking for support for those bills necessarily. We do want a bill. We need this to pass through legislation, but we want a bill that doesn't currently exist. We want bills, or we want a bill that has the specific provisions that you see within your leave behind. Yeah. And unfortunately, no bill that currently exists actually uh, honors or, or meets any of those, or all of those provisions in one bill, right? Um, and so the public support kind of is in addition to that. We want people to, we want Congress to pass this legislation, but uh, I, I like to say it's not over till it's over. And I feel like members of Congress will sometimes say, oh, I signed on to a bill, I'm done. Or, okay, yeah, I went ahead and talked to uh, leadership in Congress like you asked me to. I'm done. No, you can always do more until a bill that we want has passed through Congress, signed by the president. There's always more that can be done. And while we were talking about social media and the power of that, um, legislators have social media as well, like I just said, and they reach thousands more people, probably even millions more people than we do 
unless any, uh, we have any influencers in here, but uh, you know, I'm not reaching thousands of people when I tweet something. Uh, and so members of Congress are able to contribute to that dialogue, further that dialogue, make sure that everyone is actually talking about this issue and prioritizing it. Um, but Anika, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think you, you have it right in the sense that there are four very crucial provisions that we need to see and legislation that gets passed. And so in terms of the question of like, what does the follow-up look like? What does the follow-through look like? That's part of the reason why um, we're asking you to talk to your members of Congress about those questions in the roadmap. And then when you report back to us, that helps the migration policy team and the work that we are continuously and relentlessly doing with offices. So we know where they stand, where we know we can continue negotiations and so forth. Um, and so that they also feel a sense of accountability and pressure and saying that this issue isn't going away, that my constituents care about this. And this is that they what they wanna see. And then sort of on our end, we can continue that conversation, hopefully alongside and continued with you um, as we think about how we can get our members of Congress to finally deliver on legislation. Um, it's on the forefront of lawmakers. We know that the, the, the crux of the matter is making sure that it gets delivered and that it's as humane and as equitable as possible. Thank you, Anika. Okay, well, that wraps up our Q&A. So thank you all for asking your questions. Thank you, Anika. Thank you, Diana.